Cryogenic refrigeration is key to many of the technologies that enable research at Jefferson Lab. The lab's three particle accelerators have components that must be cryogenically cooled to operate efficiently. These components include superconducting accelerator structures, magnets, unique targets, and accelerator component testing facilities. In all, Jefferson Lab has five major cryogenic refrigerators on site. Two of these are the largest single 2 Kelvin refrigerators in the world. Jefferson Lab's two central helium liquefiers together chill more than 30,000 gallons of liquid helium by compressing warm helium gas to high pressures and then sending it through cold boxes. The cold boxes usher the helium through a sophisticated system of tiny turbine expanders, each spinning thousands of times per second, followed by a set of complex heat exchangers. The system removes energy from the helium and reduces its pressure until it becomes a superfluid, which flows without resistance and conducts heat freely. The central helium liquefiers work together to cool particle accelerator components in CBATH and the low energy recirculator facility to their operating temperature of 2 Kelvin, or minus 456 degrees Fahrenheit, just a few degrees above absolute zero. Jefferson Lab's cryogenics personnel design, build, operate, and maintain the lab's cryogenic refrigeration facilities and have provided their expertise to research facilities in the United States and around the world. Hello, I'm Jonathan Creo from the Cryogenics Department at Jefferson Lab, and I'm pleased to present this edition of Bite Size Science, the cold science of cryogenics. Jefferson Lab operates the continuous electron beam accelerator facility we call CBAP. Electrons in the injector are boosted to near the speed of light and injected into the main machine. The electrons pass through a series of cryomodules that contain superconducting RF cavities we call a LINAC. These cavities are pumped with high power microwaves that boost the energy of the electrons. Several thousand very large magnets are used to bend the electron beam around the arcs and circulate it back through a second LINAC to add more energy. The electrons can circulate up to five and a half times and are then routed into one of the four experimental halls to interact with various solid, liquid, and gas targets where large spectrometers record the nuclear interactions for study. Many parts of the machine require cooling by large specialized cryogenic facilities. So what is cryogenics? Well, it's not cooling people's heads or bodies, at least not intentionally. It is a branch of science that deals with very low temperatures, typically below negative 238 degrees Fahrenheit. We supply cryogens to various parts of the machine at various temperatures, depending on their needs. We operate the main Linux at temperatures down to 2.07 Kelvin, which is really close to absolute zero. Reaching these incredible temperatures requires significant amounts of power and large amounts of helium and nitrogen. So helium was discovered in 1868 by an astronomer. He was using a new device called a spectroscope, which separates light into its individual frequencies or spectral lines. Every excited gas has a specific set of spectral lines, like a fingerprint. He noticed a set of lines that no one had previously reported and announced his discovery, and he called it helium after the sun. It was eventually found on Earth about 14 or so years later, as a byproduct of natural gas coming out of the ground. We use helium and cryogenics because it's the only substance that's not a solid at the temperatures that we operate at. In addition, it's also a superfluid at temperatures below 2.2 Kelvin, and it has really special properties. So it takes about 760 gallons of helium gas to make one gallon of liquid helium, and we have about 26,000 gallons of liquid helium on site at any one time during normal operations. So helium becomes a superfluid when it's cooled below 2.2 Kelvin. And a superfluid, it behaves kind of like two fluids. It has a normal component that observes all the normal rules of a fluid, but it also has a second component that has zero viscosity and a very, very high heat capacity. The high heat capacity means that the helium can transfer heat very efficiently. Zero viscosity means that the fluid can move without resistance. So vortices or movements of the liquid, they basically continue forever. 
The constant movement without resistance can allow a thin film to climb up the edge of a container, spill over the edge and drip down the bottom until the container is actually empty. It also means that you can construct a container with very porous bottoms that will hold the liquid at temperatures at 4.2 Kelvin. But as soon as you pass through Lambda and it becomes a superfluid, the fluid will start pouring through the bottom of the pores like it's uh, going through a sieve. So a couple of quick definitions. Heat and temperature are not the same thing. Heat is the total energy of something like the stove burner or the liquid that's in the pot. Heat can also flow from one place to another. In this example, heat is flowing from the burner up through the pot and into the liquid. But temperature is a measurement of the average energy of something at the instant that you took the temperature measurement. So now I'm gonna take you on a virtual tour of one of our cryogenic systems, but I need to give you a little bit more information so that you can understand what you're seeing. First, refrigerators don't make heat disappear. Earlier, I told you that heat can flow from one place to another. So your, uh, like your home air conditioning system, which moves heat from inside your home to outside your home. Second, a refrigerant is the substance that's used in the refrigeration cycle. It's the media that actually moves the heat. And finally, a simple refrigeration cycle contains four steps, compression, heat rejection, expansion, and heat absorption. So now we're going to walk through these steps and illustrate them using your home air conditioning system. And then I'm going to show you what they look like in the equipment at Jefferson Lab. So the compression step uses a compressor to raise the pressure and the temperature of the refrigerant and push it through the system. The act of compressing the gas adds a lot of heat to the refrigerant. The compressor in your home air conditioning system is in the unit outside behind your home. So the heat rejection step is where the refrigerant's heat is rejected to the outside world. In your home air conditioning system, this is done with a heat exchanger that's sitting in your outside unit. As the refrigerant flows through the fin tubing, the outside air cools the refrigerant flowing inside the tubing. So the expansion step relies on a special effect named for its discoverer, Joel Thompson. This is where rapidly lowering a pressure of a gas causes it to lower its temperature. In your home air conditioning unit, this is done using an expansion valve. The high pressure refrigerant flows through an orifice in the valve. When the refrigerant exits the other side of the orifice, it's at a lower pressure and a lower temperature. So finally, during the heat absorption step, the refrigerant picks up heat, which raises its temperature. In your home air conditioning system, this is done using a heat exchanger inside your air handling unit. As your home air passes over the heat exchanger, its heat is transferred to the refrigerant and it makes the air colder. So now let's take what we just learned and let's apply it to a cryogenic flow diagram. In this diagram, we see compressors, we see heat exchangers and valves. In this particular example, we're cooling a cryomodule by moving its heat to the water and to the liquid nitrogen. So let's go through this step by step. Here we see the compressors drawing in warm helium from a gas tank. The compressor raises the pressure and temperature of the helium refrigerant. If you'll recall, I told you that compressing the gas adds a lot of temperature to it. So we remove this heat using very large water cooling towers. So the warm helium is stored in very large gas tanks like this. We have a number of these on site and we use them to store clean helium refrigerant. This video shows the gauge panel and the main control valves that control the flow of helium from the gas tanks around the compressor systems. This bottom photo gives you an idea of the size of these large valves relative to my body size. In the second video, it shows the warm helium compressor systems. These compressors range in size from 800 horsepower up to 2,500 horsepower. These are a Jefferson Lab design, and they are state-of-the-art in helium cryogenics at this time. 
The heat of compression is rejected to water instead of air. These large cooling water towers for our, are for our central helium liquefier. The first video shows the size of one of these outside towers relative to a cleaning technician. The water is held in the basin at the bottom of the tower and pumped into the building to cool the compressors. When it brings the absorbed heat back out to the tower, it comes in at the top of the tower. The hot water runs down the sides of the cooling tower before it recollects in the basin for circulation back into the building again. The second video shows the inside of one of these cooling towers. The cool water is in the basin. Here's a ball float valve that operates to bring in a makeup water to replace what's evaporated. If you look down in the bottom, you'll also see the pipe where the cold water runs out to the compressor systems. And this is the large fan that cools the water as it's flowing down the corrugated sides. The next step we call helium pre-cooling. We use liquid nitrogen in large tanks to cool the helium in one step from 80 degrees Fahrenheit to negative 315 degrees Fahrenheit. The cold nitrogen is pushed through one side of a heat exchanger, while the warm helium is pushed through the other side. The heat from the helium is moved to the nitrogen. The helium comes out colder and the nitrogen comes out warmer. The helium continues on in the cooling process and the nitrogen is vented to atmosphere. This is a liquid nitrogen delivery truck. We receive between two and three of these every day when we're in operation. The second video shows the large helium, I mean, sorry, the liquid nitrogen storage doors that the delivery trucks are filling. We also see the large helium pre-cooler unit for our CHL2. Inside of this is a large heat exchanger where the helium and nitrogen pass each other. The liquid nitrogen flows through one side and is vented and the helium flows through the other side. The cold helium travels through the insulated transfer line into the building for the next step in the cooling process. So the next step is expansion. We use turbo expanders instead of orifices. These turbo expanders spin at speeds of up to 250,000 revolutions per minute. The helium stream is split into two streams. One stream continues on toward the load. The second stream is routed through the expanders where they lower its pressure and temperature before it's routed back through the heat exchangers to absorb more heat from the stream that's flowing this way. The expanders reject their heat to water, just like the compressor system did. Here, we're looking down on a large coal box that contains the heat exchangers, the control valves, and the turbo expanders. The large transfer line is the helium flowing in from the outside unit. The large blue mushrooms are the control valves that are changing the flow of helium around the system, and the cold helium exits through these pipes here at the end and pass into the distribution system on its way to the loads. This video shows a closer view of the top of the coal box. You can see the control valves. You can see the instrumentation where we measure pressures, temperatures, and flows. And this refrigerator has seven expansion stages. Here you can see the water coolers and the turbines down here at the bottom. So we're, we're removing helium from, or the heat from inside the coal box and moving it into the water that's in these water jackets. And they, it goes out to the cooling towers. So in this stage, the cold helium passes through more heat exchangers and then through a Joule Thompson valve where the helium lowers its temperature and its pressure for one last time. When it gets to this step, about 80% of the gas flashes to a liquid and accumulates inside the cryo module and about 20% of it as comes back as gas and returns through the heat exchangers to absorb more heat from the stream going this way. So the loads in this case, as I told you, was cryo modules in the LINAC. These modules contain superconducting cavities submerged in 2.07 Kelvin liquid helium. The cavities must be at this temperature in order to perform and accelerate the electron beam, which passes through the center of the modules like this. So helium at one atmosphere of pressure is 4.22 Kelvin. In order to go colder, we have to lower its pressure down to 0.039 atmospheres. 
We accomplish this by using a special device called a cold compressor, which is basically a cold vacuum pump. The cold compressors lower the vapor pressure inside the cryo module, but they compress the helium back to a higher pressure and push it back through the heat exchangers to absorb more heat from the helium stream coming toward the load. This is what a cold compressor system looks like. This system was designed and built here at Jefferson Lab, and it is the latest and state-of-the-art technology for 2-Kelvin cryogenics. Here you can see the internal piping is covered by a special insulation called super insulation. This picture shows the top of the cold box, and you can see the motors and the motor controls for the five stages of cold compressor. So here are two video clips that show the system controls in real time. Our group designs, builds, and programs the control systems like these to operate these very large helium cryogenic systems. And in these pictures, you can see compressors and expanders, and you can see the flow of helium around the system and look at the pressures, temperatures, and mass flows. So as you can imagine, things are not always perfect. As engineers and technicians, we normally have to deal with, with strange situations that come up once in a while, such as leaks or cold piping. This video clip shows a four Kelvin leak through a cracked bellows. The helium exiting the crack is negative 455 degrees Fahrenheit. The white gas is the air condensing because of the cold temperatures. The second clip shows a pressure relief valve that is popped open, but it didn't reseal. And the flow of cold helium is freezing the moisture in the air into layers on the metal surfaces. The third clip shows four Kelvin helium flowing through a pipe with no insulation. If you look carefully, you can see a clear liquid flowing off the pipe. This is liquid air. The pipe is so cold that the air around the pipe is condensing into liquid nitrogen and liquid oxygen. If I were to touch this liquid, I would receive skin burns and probably frostbite. This liquid is about 400 degrees colder than the ambient temperatures in the room. So as a final step, so we support a lot of cryogenic activities at Jefferson Lab. We design and build new plants depending on what's happening around the accelerator, but we also support a lot of outside projects. So we've supported designing and building two cryogenic systems for the Michigan State University. One was for their facility for rare isotope beans. The other was for their national superconducting cyclotron lab. We also designed and built the cryogenic systems for the Na Oak Ridge National um, Spallation Neutron Source. We also got to do a project for NASA Houston's Manned Space Flight Center where they have a very large vacuum chamber. You can see two people down in, at the bottom here to give you an idea of the scale. This vacuum chamber was originally designed to test the Apollo command and service modules back during the Apollo space age, but most recently it was used to test the James Webb telescope before it was put into space. And finally, right now, we're working on a project where we designed and built and we're starting up right now the cryogenic facilities for Stanford University's light coherent light source, which is going to be a very powerful X-ray machine that they're going to use to help study matter. Thank you for your time. I appreciate you listening to me today. Thank you, Jonathan. Hi, everyone. My name is Lauren. I'm also a member of the Jefferson Lab team. I'll be helping Jonathan with the Q&A portion of the session. Um, while we do have several questions that were pre-submitted, if anyone attending this has a question, please feel free to type it into the chat and we will get through as many as we can in the time that's remaining, which is about 10 minutes. Um, so Jonathan, the first question I have for you is, why can't the lab use regular refrigerants like those used in cars and HVAC systems to run their cryogenic refrigerators? Yeah, that's a good question. I get that one a lot from people when I'm talking to them about what we do. Um, so as I said early on in the, in the slide presentation that uh, we have to use helium because the temperatures we operate are so cold that all the other substances that we know of, for example, freon or ammonia or even oxygen, all of those uh, chemicals are basically solids at the temperature that we operate at. And we need something that remains a gas and a liquid so that we can push it through our system. 
and helium is the only substance that meets those criteria. Got it. Okay, awesome. Um, so the next question I have is I heard that there is a shortage in helium. Does that impact the work here at Jefferson Lab? Yeah, um, so there's a there's a lot of talk about um, helium being uh, hard to get and uh, shortages, like you were saying, because various uh, facilities have come and gone offline that produce this helium. And so, yeah, we, we have to plan way ahead of time. We have established contracts with vendors and we tell them what our usages are going to be and they have to plan ahead. And so we, we have this constant uh, discourse going on with our vendors so that they're constantly aware of what our plans are and they can plan ahead and make sure that they have plenty of helium to provide us. So we have not been impacted directly by any of the shortages yet. Okay, perfect. Um, so the next question I have is how often does the lab run its cryogenic refrigerators for research? So we have five cryogenic plants on site right now that support different parts of the machine. And we essentially run them all of the time. Um, the plants uh, do better when they're running. Um, and so what we'll do is we run them all the time, but we'll have maintenance intervals planned out where we have to shut down periodically during um, times when the accelerator is not running and, and we'll do maintenance on the plants. But typically that might be uh, say three months out of the year, and it may only occur every few years. Other than that, we run the cryogenic plants. Okay, um, so this is an interesting question. How, how, what happens when the cryogenic system fails? Yeah, that's a good one. And so it's, uh, as you can imagine, running five cryogenic plants on site, these are very complex machines. They have a lot of rotating equipment parts. They have a lot of electrical parts and they have a lot of control parts, um, cards and, and software that all provide the uh, operational um, conditions for these plants. And so we do suffer failures. We, uh, we work very hard since we're the engineers that design the plants and we're engineers that can uh, operate the plants. We work very hard at trying to identify weak points in the systems. And we've changed those weak points to make them strong points. And we try to make our equipment as robust as possible, but we still suffer from failures occasionally. And so I, you know, I'm part of a big group of uh, almost 50 people and we have, you know, electrical engineers and technicians and mechanical engineers and technicians. And we have our own welders and pipe fitters and electricians, and we're all trained in various aspects of keeping this equipment running. And so when an alarm happens or a piece of equipment shuts off in the middle of the night or on the weekends or even during the day, um, we'll get called, the, the correct people will come in, they'll evaluate the situation, we'll make sure that um, we can safe out the system and make it safe for people to operate and, and do repairs and then we'll bring those components back online. So it's a big team effort. It requires a lot of really smart people. I personally am really uh, amazed uh, at some of the, the capabilities that we have here at Jefferson Lab. Awesome. Um, so we have a couple questions in the chat. Um, the first one is, can you make uh, ice cream with liquefied helium? Well, we've never done that with helium because helium is so much colder than the ambient temperatures around that it boils so rapidly that you wouldn't be able to keep it into an open container very long. Um, what we have done in the past, of course, is we've made ice cream using uh, liquid nitrogen, which is much more, uh, it's cheaper, it's easier to get, and it's easier to stay in the liquid form while you're trying to make the ice cream. Helium is very expensive, and so we don't use it for things like that. <laughs> okay. Um, and then another question, why do you have the liquid nitrogen trucked in instead of making it yourself? Oh, that's a good question. That's a good question. So right now, We've, uh, we've actually uh, done the analysis several times and we do this every few years and we look at how much nitrogen we consume versus how much we spend to buy it versus how much it would cost to have the capital equipment and the extra people on site and the extra electric power usage to be able to uh, produce our own. And so right now it's substantially cheaper for us to buy it from a vendor and have it delivered than what we could produce it for on site right now. And that's one reason why we do it. But we we go through that analysis every few years just to make sure that it's staying uh, economically feasible for us. 
Great, thank you. Um, we actually have a question. Uh, could you possibly go into any more detail about the Stanford uh, Coherent X-ray Project? Project? I, I'll go into a little bit. There are uh, links on site. If you do the search on the web, you can go straight to their site and you can get a lot more information. But basically, they're using uh, an existing tunnel that's up there at the Stanford Accelerator Facility. And we're installing cryo modules in that tunnel. And we're building two very large cryogenic plants that are there that will keep those cryo modules cold. And the whole premise of it is to produce sort of the brightest x-rays uh, in the uh, world at the time they're going to uh, commission this, this facility. And then they're going to use those x-rays to do some studies of matter and things. But if you, if you go out and you do a search on the website, you'll, you'll be able to find the, and more information on that. The cryogenic plants that we're building there are a slightly smaller version than the ones we have here at Jefferson Lab, but they are very large machines. Okay, um, and then uh, another question, uh, actually one that was pre-submitted, um, how do you keep, uh, how does the lab keep all of the cold components cold all of the time? <laughs> yeah, so um, like I said earlier, we try to run the cryogenic facilities and we try to keep the things that need to be cold, cold um, most of the time. We only warm them up if we have to work on something or if something's broken and we have to address those problems. The reason is, is that when you cool down equipment, let's say just a piece of pipe, when you cool down a piece of pipe from room temperature to the cryogenic temperatures we operate at, the, it shrinks. And when you warm it up, it expands again. And every time you go through these processes, it adds wear and tear on the equipment, wear and tear on the piping, wear and tear on the piping joints. And there's always, you know, the potential for leaks to happen or things to break. And so we'll tend to try to keep things cold all of the time and not put them through these thermal stresses. I mean, just one example is our one of our main transfer lines that runs down the North Lenac, for example. It's you know a couple thousand feet long, but when we cool that transfer line down, it shrinks in length by about three feet, and so all of the joints have to take up that take up that space. And so uh, we try to not do that unless we have a problem. Okay, thank you. And we have a couple more questions in the chat um, about science experiments. Do you know what new science experiments we have in store at the lab? No, I'm I'm not an expert at all on the experiments that get run in the halls. That would be something again you would need to to look on the uh, on the website for. Um, we basically in cryogenics are sort of support activities. So what we'll do is we meet with people, we decide what the loads are going to be, how much cooling power we have to supply, and then we keep the physicists happy by cooling down their equipment. And then they're the ones that do the experiments and and use the beam for the purposes of studying, you know, protons, neutrons, or uh, the quarks and and um, and things that they're looking at. So I would suggest you go to the website, you do some searches and in there, it'll tell you the experiments that are currently running and what may be coming down the pipeline. Perfect, thank you. And uh, one other question we have, probably uh, just time for this one. And if there's any more in the chat, um, if two Kelvin is the temperature used at Jefferson Lab to cool the accelerator, does that technically make Jefferson Lab the coldest place on earth? It's one of the coldest places on earth. So if you think about it, cryogenic plants really have two major components. One is the temperature you're operating at, and one is the capacity that you can operate at. And so Jefferson Lab is not the coldest temperature in the, uh, in the country right now. There are some universities and some other places that have uh, lower temperatures that are down in the micro Kelvin and nano Kelvin ranges. Um, but they're very small machines. They're, they, they cool down things that are very tiny and they, they're sort of, you know, much, much smaller machines. They're not at all of the same scale that our large helium refrigerators are. So our refrigerators right now, the two that we have here on site called the central helium liquefiers are uh, the largest two Kelvin single cold compression machines in the country right now. These things are really, really uh, state of the art. Wonderful. Well, that is actually um, all the time we have now for questions. Um, thank you for your time today. And uh, back to you, Jonathan. All right. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you giving me this opportunity to share what we do. So 
I'm going to tell you that the next Bite Size Science event is going to be coming out on August 25th, and it's titled The Art of Machine Learning. Thank you.